Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can find us online at rce-cast.com. You can find links to um, Jeff's the blogs, the Twitters, and all that other fun stuff. Uh, also, I have again with me Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and one of the authors of Open MPI. Jeff. Hey, folks. Yeah, it's that it's that traditional posts SC letdown time of the year, right, where everything kind of you're just trying to finish out the year and you take a little lull and stuff like that. So we've only got one show this month and it's it's the last one of the year. But uh, forgive us for that. We'll be back in 2014 with better, bigger, more stuff. But uh, in that light. Um, today's show actually features some of our friends that we ran into at Supercomputing, um, and we have some cool stuff to talk about, right, Brock? Yeah, yeah. So um, this is, and, and also we have. I think this is we. This is a dubious distinction for this episode. This is the first time our guests have ever attended via iPad because we we record via Skype. But I'm pretty sure we've never had anybody. Attending on Skype via iPad before, so this is a minor first for the show. Well, this is this is how you kind of get around some of those uh, workplace rules, or not really get around. I believe they're also like on a trailer off site to be able to even make this call. So, uh, our our guests today are actually um, Catherine Moore and Adam Moody, uh, both of Lawrence Livermore National Lab, who are going to be talking to us about a scalable checkpoint restart. So, uh, Catherine, why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself? Hello, everybody. I'm Catherine Moore, as he said. I'm a researcher at uh, the Livermore National Lab. I work um, in basically scalable tools for high-performance computing, uh, for example, fault-tolerance tools and uh, performance analysis tools. Adam? Yeah, so this is uh, Adam Moody, uh, also here at Livermore. I um, graduated from Ohio State um, and then started my career out here in 2004, uh, mainly hired to support the computer center uh, with an MPI background. Um, and with that, uh, sort of also got involved with uh, fault tolerance, which is uh, how SCR, or the Scalable Checkpoint Research Library, came to be. So I, I got to say something in here because I got to point out I'm at the University of Michigan and I'm very sorry about a certain football game. Um, and I'm sure you're very happy about a certain football game, but most people don't know University of Michigan and Ohio State are rivals. He has so. Buckeyes around his neck right now. He has Buckeyes around his neck right now. I'm, <laughs> I'm virtually punching you in the face. <laughs> from, from Brock your... is sad panda. That is that is more politically correct right yes. now, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, but right, let's so go let me ahead. start off the official part of the podcast by, uh, hey, Adam, uh, Catherine, why don't you tell us uh, what Checkpoint Restart is? And, and let's start off with a simple case, like a single process case. What is kind of the goal of, of Checkpoint Restart and what is it? Um, yeah, so – the idea of checkpointing is if you if you have a long running job that could be interrupted, uh, you occasionally want to save the state of that job so that if it does get interrupted, you can re- recover from that state. Um, and so the analogy I like to use to, with people is, um, you know, imagine that you're working on a, a Word document or something. You're writing a paper. You occasionally save your work every couple of hours because in the case that Microsoft crashes, uh, you don't want to have to rewrite that couple of hours worth of work. So maybe every five minutes you save whatever work you've done, and then you can restart from that in case you get the blue screen of death. <laughs> now, we don't usually get the blue screen of death in high-performance computing, though, so what kind of reasons do you have for Checkpoint Restart? Well, yeah, so in HPC, it's um, it's sort of the same idea. You, you don't get the blue screen of death only because we're not running Microsoft, right? But Linux also fails, and the hardware also fails. But the bigger problem is that you're using far more processes. Um, and so typical HPC jobs at a large computer center might be using, say, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, even a million processes at, at once. And all of those could fail either because of software problems or hardware problems. Uh, and these simulations tend to also run for a couple of weeks at, at a time. And so you're almost guaranteed that something will fail along the way. And so to combat that, people use checkpoint restart. Each process saves its state periodically, and then you can restart the job in the case of a failure. 
So it seems like a really naive way to do this would just be to serialize everything in RAM and write it to disk. Um, what are some of the problems with doing something like that? Well, primarily the problems are um, the high overhead of reading and writing the checkpoints uh, to the parallel file system. And this occurs because when you have a large number of processes in your job and they're all trying to read or write at the same time, uh, the parallel file system becomes a, a huge bottleneck. And um, this overhead is a pretty serious problem. Um, for example, for a large scale job, it could take on the order of 30 or 40 minutes just to write out a checkpoint. And during that time, the entire job is blocked, just waiting for it to finish. And uh, so the machine is um, not well utilized in that way. So really, uh, actually, just one clarification point. It's not dependent upon a parallel file system, right? It's, it's writing to any stable storage, right? Just, just to clarify that. Uh, well, that's the um, the approach that SCR takes is writing to any kind of stable storage. But typically, without um, a library like SCR, the only storage available uh, is the parallel file system. Okay, so then maybe you could broaden your definition a bit. So I asked Adam specifically about you know checkpoint restart in a single process state, and you've kind of alluded that you know with these big parallel jobs, there's lots of processes running on. What? How do you apply checkpoint restart to an HPC job? Just expand that definition a little. Well, so um, it, it turns out at Livermore that we we sort of force a failure um, every so often, just because we we timeshare the machine. Um, so applications will run maybe for weeks at a time, but we only give them maybe twelve hours at a time on the machine, so that multiple people can make use of the machine at once. Uh, so at least every 12 hours, they they have to stop the job and then in another 12-hour window, pick up where it left off. Um, and so the way people have dealt with that is that each process right now um, will open a file, uh, write out whatever state it needs to capture, close the file, and then those files are, are saved on the parallel file system because that's where they can persist the data between runs. So why go directly to a parallel file system? Why not just use, a lot of times, nodes have a local drive. Why not do file per process and kind of aggregate them up later? Well, a part of the, well, that is what SCR does. But the problem with doing that naively is that if you lose a compute node, you've lost the checkpoints if they aren't pushed out to some um, stable storage or if you don't apply some redundancy schemes, like copy a checkpoint to a different compute node uh, to prevent loss in case of a failure. So that's where SCR comes into play, is it does all this magic for you, and you just have to write your checkpoints like you normally would, but you experience much, much lower overhead. I see. So one of the issues you're running into might be the actual failure of the node or even the disk itself, not just this 12-hour reset uh, for time-sharing purposes. And so in that case, if you wrote out to the local disk, it's effectively gone and you can't get it. That's what you're saying, right? Correct, yes. Now, what other kinds of failures can uh, occur? Well, the, uh, so the compute nodes, we, we call them nodes, right? They're, um, they're really an individual computer, but because computer has too many syllables, we say node all the time. Um, but a node basically is made up of a, mother a motherboard, a processor, some RAM, a network card, and maybe you have a disk on the node or not. Um, so any of those components uh, could fail. Uh, the the ones actually the ones that we see most often are the power supply on the motherboard. Um, network cards are also a common failure. Every now and then we'll see some processor failures um, uh, or some RAM failures. The the other big failure mode though is really software. And the parallel file system. Oh, right. And, yes, the parallel file system also fails, unfortunately. Now, when you say the software fails, though, I would imagine that it would fail for all processes in the job. Like, it's a user error. Are you, are you talking about something else? Well, the, I guess each of the different processes is going to be um, executing with different data. And so one reason uh, might be that there's some instability in the computation and they get a floating point exception or something like that on one of the ranks and not the others. So what would happen in that case, they would restart from one of the checkpoints taken previously, right? Right. So the uh, MPI job would abort in that case and then um, SCR would restart 
the job using the most recent checkpoint, which could be stored or cached on some node local storage or on um, maybe on the parallel file system if those got corrupted. Now you say SCR would restart it. Um, I'm used to checkpoints requiring user intervention to say, hey, restart from a checkpoint. Um, this is something that's kind of like built in, like is it a process that wraps your normal job or what's going on here? Uh, right. So when you run your job on an HPC system, you usually use some launch command. So uh, for example, on a Slurm system, you, you would use srun. And in the case of using SCR, you would use um, our wrapper script, SCR srun. And uh, this script um, does a lot of things, um, one of which is uh, launch your job for you and notice if it dies, and if it does, um, it can uh, restart it for you. Um, it does other things too, like uh, checking to make sure that uh, all the nodes in your job are still healthy, and uh, if any of them has gone down and you happen to allocate a couple of extra nodes in your job, um, it can um, pull in the spare nodes for your job and ignore the failed ones so you can continue computing. It also makes sure that the last checkpoint uh, that was taken gets pushed out to the parallel file system so that the next time you restart your job in a new allocation, um, you'll have that last checkpoint. Okay, so we started to touch on some SCR specific types of things. What is it that, because there have been a lot of checkpoint restart systems in the past um, and, and some that are still out there. What is it, give me like the top two or three things that make SCR super awesome and cool and different from the others and why you felt the need to do to create SCR as opposed to the systems that are already out there? Well, uh, so the, the motivation really came, um, I guess, because of the, MPI background. Um, so we, we had a system way back in 2007 we brought in named Atlas. Um, and like any new system you bring in, you encounter all kinds of, of uh, software failures and hardware failures. Um, and so we had an application trying to run on that system, and they had a deadline that they had to meet. But the system was just too unreliable um, to, to allow them to run. It was taking something like 30 or 40 minutes for them to save a checkpoint to the, to the file system but they maybe were failing every hour or two. Um, and so they were essentially spending all of their time writing checkpoints and not really doing any real work. Um, and just doing sort of a back of the envelope calculation uh, from an MPI side, you know, that 30 or 40 minutes felt like a really long time uh, to me. So it, it was apparent that if you could somehow store the data and memory on the cluster itself using the high-speed network, rather than writing it to disk, uh, you could checkpoint much faster and then checkpoint more often uh, so that you could actually make progress. Uh, and so what SCR does is it, it stores these checkpoints in node local storage. At that time, we didn't even have disk on the, on the cluster, so we were storing in memory. But because of that, we were able to save a checkpoint in 10 seconds instead of the half hour it normally required. Uh, and with that, we were able to checkpoint maybe every 10 or 15 minutes instead of the four hours or seven hours, whatever the code was using before. So do I just tell SCR, like, kind of what my disk hierarchy is, like where it should kind of do its first checkpoint and then where it kind of should move it after from node local, you know, memory, uh, node memory, node local disk, parallel file system? Yeah, that's right. It's um, right now because the each system at different centers are sort of configured differently. Some have local disk, some don't. Some have RAM disk, some don't. Um, some have parallel file systems, uh, maybe multiple parallel file systems that could be used. Um, all of that right now has to be configured in to SCR once using a configuration file. Um, and then the, the library will, based on the speed of each device, can save checkpoints at different levels at different times. So does this require administrator intervention to get SCR going, or is this completely live in user space? It's completely in user space. So it, um, the only requirements are that uh, it's ported to support the resource manager on the machine. Uh, so currently, um, SCR works sh or should work pretty much out of the box on Linux clusters that use Slurm as the resource manager. Um, however, in uh, I'd say the past year and a half, we've been making a lot of porting efforts. Um, and it will run on Cray XTs. Um, assuming that RAM disk is enabled, um, because they don't typically have it enabled. Um, and uh, we started porting to uh, BlueJean, 
Um, and we're also happy to help anyone set it up on their systems or for their particular resource manager. Now, you say this is a all user space. How do you grab the, the process state? Or, or are you really just grabbing um, the, the user, you know, the malloc state and the stack state and stuff like that? Do you, do you capture the program execution stack or is it just data? No, it, this is um, an, what we call an application level checkpointing library. Uh, what you're describing is um, more of a system uh, checkpoint um, method where the system would take a snapshot of, um, as you say, the process and then dump it all out. But uh, SCR works um, when the application explicitly makes um, its own I.O. calls and put, puts out the data it wants to save. And this has advantages because you're, you end up storing a lot less data. You don't have to store the entire memory space. You just have to store the the data structures that the application needs. I see. So, so does the uh, application do they they register the data structures that they want saved with you somehow, or uh, otherwise indicate say, oh, if uh, whenever a checkpoint occurs, I need you to save this this page or this block of memory or whatever. Well, it's it's um, it's really just all POSIX uh, I/O based. Uh, so the the application will um, open whatever file it wants to create, um, and then write the data to that file and then close it. Uh, what it what it has to do is ask SCR where it should open the file at. Um, so SCR will direct it um, either to say RAM disk on the on the node or to a, a local SSD or maybe to the parallel file system. And then the application will open the file in that place, write all of its data, close the file, and then it has to tell SCR when it's done. Um, and so SCR is keeping track of all the files written by all the processes. And then it also uh, applies any kind of redundancy scheme to the data once all of the processes have finished writing their data. I see. So the notification that the application gets, that's more of what the service, or at least that end of the service, uh, what SCR provides is a, a hook for it's time to checkpoint and it's time to restore and things like that. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Now, on the website for SCR, you also describe something called multi-level checkpointing. Can you describe that? Well, that's a general term for the kind of library that SCR is. And it refers to um, the idea that you take different levels of checkpoints that have uh, different costs associated with them and a uh, different um, level of reliability. So, for example, a level one checkpoint might be writing um, just to the local storage, just to the RAM disk. And so that's really cheap. Um, but as we said before, if you lose that compute node, you've now lost that checkpoint. So uh, then we move up to what we call maybe a level two checkpoint, which would be applying a redundancy scheme on that local checkpoint. So you might copy it over to a partner node um, to prevent loss. And level three could be um, storing it out to the parallel file system in the event that there's some sort of catastrophic loss or maybe it's just the end of your allocation. Wait, wait, wait. You said um, a copy to a partner node? So like SCR can kind of be while you continue on with your next step, be shuffling the local checkpoints among each other so you can lose a single node but not have to hit the parallel file system yet? That's right, uh, except uh, currently uh, this happens um uh, the job is synchronized and stopped while this is happening. It's not a very long operation. Yeah, it's it only takes maybe 10 seconds if you're using memory to save a, a checkpoint of, say, um, 600 megabytes per process. Um, and that includes the time to shuffle the data to another node and, and save it there. Uh, if you're using SSD, it might take something more like um, three three to five minutes uh, so it's it's a pretty quick process, uh, and the and the applications tend not to do it too often. Maybe every ten minutes, fifteen minutes, um, and so that cost isn't too high. So is SCR itself an an MPI application that's kind of doing that communication memory to memory, or but then also how does it interact with like? Does it use MPI to read from one disk and re write it to the other? Like, how do you go, like, in-memory I.O. and disk I.O. are different. <laughs> and how does it actually move stuff around? Uh, yeah, so it's, SCR really is written on top of MPI and POSIX I.O. Um, those are really the two interfaces it needs. Um, and it, as far as getting data from a remote disk, uh, all the operations are synchronous. So all the processes essentially enter SCR function calls at the same time. There's about six uh, SCR API calls. 
and five of them are collective. Um, and so all the processes enter the call at the same time. And then we use MPI to exchange data between nodes at that time. Okay, okay. So everything's our function calls. There's not like extra SCR processes that are being started up. It's really a library and you say, I'm going to save this. And you say, I'm writing it out. And SCR kind of captures that operation. So it's aware of what that is called and where it is. Right. Yeah. There's, I mean, that's sort of, there's sort of two components. There's the library component, which is what we're describing here. And there's also the, the set of scripts that, that run outside of the job uh, to manage a sort of restarting the job if that's necessary or scavenging the last checkpoint from uh, node local storage to the parallel file system at the end of the job if if that's needed. We also do have a capability where um, we can write data asynchronously to the parallel file system. So some of the some of the checkpoints that we cache locally on the cluster, we want to drain down to the parallel file system and we have some processes that can run in the background to do that drain. Now, what you've described is somewhat some some asynchronous behavior, like two things that I can think of offhand is, uh, number one, you have to receive some kind of incoming control message that says it's now time to do a checkpoint, and all the MPI processes uh, do that at least more, more or less simultaneously. And the other one is uh, you said you've got this asynchronous uh, writing to the file system stuff happening. How do you do these kinds of things? Do you assume that the MPI is thread multiple aware, for example? No, 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 that's not how it works. Uh, so the checkpointing done by the application is globally synchronous in the SCR model. So all the processes stop, uh, write their checkpoints um, as they're directed by SCR, so to uh, RAM disk or whatever disk, and then they um, complete their checkpoints um, with an SCR API call. After that point, if you want to do the asynchronous transfer to the parallel file system, there are uh, separate daemon processes that are not... Um, part of the MPI application that will um, pull the checkpoints from RAM disk and slowly drain them to the parallel file system in the background. There's there's okay. a signal sent from the library to these additional daemon processes. And, and one of the ways we do that is just through the file system itself. So the library will write a small file out that the daemon looks for periodically. And when it sees that, it has instructions in it to actually flush the data down to the parallel file system. And then uh, one, one other uh, point to your question there is, so that the application knows when it should checkpoint. One of the six API calls is to inform the application when it should checkpoint. And so the idea is that whenever the application gets to a point where it's easy for the programmer to checkpoint it, he can make one of these calls to determine whether SCR thinks uh, he should go ahead and take a checkpoint based on the performance of the storage and the failure rate of the machine. So what are some of the things SCR can't handle like open file handles things like that like what kind of you know what state do you really need to make sure your application is in before you say okay i'm going to checkpoint now well that's up to the application itself uh since scr is not doing system level checkpointing um things like sockets or open file handles don't matter in an essence it just matters what hap the data that ends up in the checkpoint files that the application writes yeah, from the application side, there's um, there's not much that it can't handle because the app, there's sort of a set of semantics that the application writer has to adhere to, and as so long as he does that, um, the SCR will recover the data fine. Um, the, the bigger issue that we've run into is if you're always forced to restart from the parallel file system, SCR doesn't gain you much. The, the real benefit from SCR is that you can save some of these checkpoints locally on the cluster, which is way faster, maybe 100 to 1,000 times faster typically than writing them down to the parallel file system. But if you're always forced to restart from the parallel file system, um, then it doesn't gain you much. Um, and so sometimes that happens. Actually, one of the main culprits is if the parallel file system itself is faulty so that we can't flush one of the checkpoints down to the parallel file system. That turns out to um, create a, a problem so that you can't restart from the cache very often. You always have to restart from something on the parallel file system. It's also bad at squirrels. Uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> so, I, so I'm we, reminded of the movie Up at this point. What? what <laughs> so every every now and then, unfortunately, the um, the computer center will go down 
due to a power glitch. Um, sometimes squirrels play on the power lines. <laughs> so whenever, whenever the whole center goes down, it, it doesn't recover from that. Okay. <laughs> so I, I'm curious then how, you know, you guys at LLNL, um, actually handle this thing. Cause if you're saying restoring from the parallel file system doesn't work very well, but you also talked about like, well, you have to kind of, you kind of get evicted every 12 hours, you know, cause it's just a timeshare system. And that's definitely the kind of environment that I operate. So how do you guys handle that case where you don't necessarily know that you're going to be put on the same number of processors or the same location of processors for those local checkpoints? Right. Um, when you lose your allocation um, and have to restart in a new one, you always have to restart from the parallel file system. Um, on our systems, even if you got the exact same set of compute nodes in your next allocation, uh, they would be wiped clean after your job had terminated for security and privacy reasons. We're, we're looking at adding optimizations to the resource manager so that um, between jobs, if you happen to get the same set of nodes, which actually turn turns up a lot in practice um, that you could restart from the cache rather than the parallel file system in that case. Uh, but for that, you have to start modifying the resource manager. Yeah, so that's definitely future work. Other possibilities um, that you could add in, again, implementation to the resource manager is that if you know in advance which nodes you're going to be running on, you could try, start to preload the data from the the file system to some sort of cache before the job starts to run. And similarly, at the, at the end of the job, you could start to drain the data from the nodes in the background while the second job has started running. So another question I would have is how intrusive actually is the SCR library? So you, know, you said you need support from the resource manager. Well, what if my code is something that I both run you know, on a large HPC center or – but I may run on, like, say, a PBS system. I noticed you didn't mention that. I run PBS. Please make it work on PBS. And then <laughs> um, what if I also kind of like, you know, I do prototyping or something like that, just like on a desktop or a workstation. Um, do I just need to skip all my checkpointing? Or, like, how is it act if it's on a system that doesn't technically support SCR or SRUN? Well, it, it just wouldn't work unless we did the port. So SCR... Uh, S run and SCR AP run uh, if you're running on a Cray uh, require certain information from the resource manager during the run of the job and if it can't get it, it's most likely the scripts would fail. Yeah, A lot of that you can sort of hack around. It, it reads a lot of that information through environment variables and so if you just know which environment variables to set you can sort of fake it uh, so that it looks like it's on an allocation um, that's as far as the library goes, which is probably what you would be prototyping on your desktop anyway, is, is actually just getting the application to work correctly. Without the scripts, yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, the scripts are the most dependent on the um, the resource manager. Okay, so if I don't want SCR to be doing all of its like, local, remote, you know, like hierarchy of stuff, if I literally just want to be able to run it on my desktop and get checkpoints every now and then, it, it will still work? Yeah, it, sh it should still work. I mean, you wouldn't really want to do that for real checkpointing because you you probably aren't failing enough anyway for it to to be useful. But it, you know, as far as development, if you're just trying to develop your application and and encode SCR into your application, yeah, you should be able to get that to work. Okay, so I, I, if I write something using SCR, I'm no longer stuck on. I can only run it on a cluster that has Slurm or Cray, um, you know, AP run. I can actually still take that code other places and it will still work. I just won't get the benefits that SCR provides. Right, that the scripts provide, correct. Right. All right, so going back before we go too far away, I want to ask a little bit about the I.O. Uh, that you do, particularly when you're doing – I mean it sounds like the wins that you get from SCR can be very crassly – uh, categorized as locality, right? So when you write to a RAM disk, you know, that's super local and it's super fast. And But then you might write to an adjacent RAM and that's a little bit farther away. So it's a little bit slower, but still pretty fast. And, and the farthest away is the remote file system. And that can take really, really long time. So, you know, when you're in this sense, it's, it's you know, just classic locality types of issues just with potentially very large amounts of data. 
Um, one of the other traditional optimizations for large data to remote locations um, is IO coordination. Do you guys, does SCR do anything about that? Like, okay, U5 right, now U5 right, and U5 right, and it's, and it's actually uh, more performant than having all 20 of them right at the same time, and, and, and things like that. Um, does SCR take advantage of any of that kind of stuff? Well, uh, yeah, we do when we, um, when we write a checkpoint down to the parallel file system. Um, so all of those checkpoints are, are cached on the, on the local storage. We don't impose any kind of coordination on those checkpoints. So when we're writing to local storage, we assume that that's scalable. Um, and then when writing down to the parallel file system, we, we do limit the number of writers that can, can write at a time. Um, and that is up to the user to, to set. So it defaults to something reasonable. Um, but then the person running the job can always tweak that based on his system. Okay. And then a follow on to that is, uh, parallel file systems tend to hide this, but, um, I don't suppose that SCR is network topology aware at all. Right. So it's like, Oh, I know I'm, close to you know the actual io nodes or i'm far from the io nodes and you can do a balance of these kinds of things simply because you do have the distinction of near versus far already so near ram disk near local storage far remote storage things like that i was just wondering how deep does that go are you actually aware of the topology of the network we haven't we haven't coded any of that logic in yet, at least uh, for I/O purposes. Um, it's not hard to do though. Like we we've set things up so that, that it's possible to do that, but we haven't run on any systems where we've needed to. Um, sort of a more interesting thing to consider is um, hardware topology. Uh, so most of the time, you'll just see a single node failure on a lot of our clusters. Occasionally, you'll get multiple nodes fail at once. But even when multiple nodes fail, it, it's often because one piece of hardware failed that all of those nodes depended on, like a power supply or a switch, a network switch, something like that. And so you do have to code some uh, hardware topology or system architecture topology into SCR for it to really be effective. So when you're doing the node local, I assume that's file per process or file per node, but then you kind of like do the drain off to the file system. On these really large systems, you may have you know, 10,000 nodes, do you actually end up with, are you literally just copying 10,000 files or does it kind of in that drain merge them back together with like MPI IO? So I have one nice large thing that doesn't beat up a metadata server. Well, the applications that SCR support um, do write a file per process. And the reason behind that is that's what our codes here at Livermore do typically. Um, it, it has historically had the best performance out to the parallel file system for regular checkpoint restart. So um, we have been doing some research into um, merging and compressing uh, checkpoints before pushing them out to the parallel file system. Um, but that's still in research prototype state. Um, we have had much better I.O. performance um, using that model. Right, yeah. So it's right now we will write the 10,000 files out to the parallel file system. And, and we have some options in there that you can combine uh, files into into a container. And, and we're, we're doing some further research on compressing while also doing that combination. Yeah, the but, compressing stuff I could see like, you know, deduplicating ghost zones and stuff like that or something like that. I mean, there are a lot of duplicated data sometimes in distributed memory applications. Right. We haven't looked at that aspect yet. Um, we've been more looking at uh, trying to put data that might be similar uh, across processes together. So, for example, each process might have a chunk of the temperature array. And if we merge or concatenate the um, different bits of the temperature array from, say, a group of 10 processes and then compress them, we might get better compression than if we simply uh, compressed a single checkpoint from a single process. So that's the approach we're taking right now. Yeah, you can imagine, let's say, like a weather modeling code where you've divided the space above the U.S. into two by two or, or uh, two-dimensional cells, right? And so processes that are neighbors to each other in that grid uh, are likely to have temperatures that are similar. Um, you know, the state of Washington and Oregon are likely to be similar, uh, much more similar than the state of Washington and Florida. 
Now, along those lines, do you attempt to do any kind of data deduplication? Again, along the lines of optimizing uh, far and remote file storage kinds of things. No, we haven't. We haven't looked at data deduplication at all yet. We're hoping that the application writers aren't writing a lot of redundant data to begin with, but we we haven't looked at that. Are there other organizations who use SCR, or is this pretty much a Livermore specific technology? Uh, I wouldn't say it's Livermore specific, although um, we do use it here. Uh, I know it's been used over at um, Los Alamos. I I worked on the port and installed it on Cielo and Cielito, um, and oh. We have a mailing list, and we get. Um, uh, what, what, I'm sorry. What are those? Ciel, what? Oh, they are uh, Cray machines at Los Alamos, Cielo, ah, okay. and Cielito. Okay. And then on our mailing list, uh, we periodically get uh, users asking about installation and running issues. So they must be doing something with SCR. <laughs> yeah, it's all open source, of course, so people can download it and use it. We we don't know who might be using it. We we have gotten. Um, emails from users at different sites uh, it currently seem to be mostly researchers looking at it, probably also researching fault tolerance. Um, not yet aware of any other large scale user, but we're, we're happy to help people get it set up on their systems if they would like to give it a whirl. Have you had any requests for alternatives? You said like right now it's memory or POSIX. Um, but you're also doing a file per process, which looks very much like a bunch of objects I could stick into some sort of object store. How hard would it be to make one of those hierarchies of stick it off into my object archive or something like that? Um, that is some research that we have uh, going on right now with um, Argonne National Lab. Um, in this case, our object store we're calling containers, and you would put checkpoints into containers and then um, behind the scenes, an I.O. forwarding layer would uh, move these containers between different levels of the storage hierarchy. So we're planning um, the system to work um, on future multi-tiered storage systems where there would be no, maybe no local storage and then burst buffers and then finally maybe some other storage in the parallel file system. Right, because I could see someone wanting to say like every fifth checkpoint because it contains more data I actually want to analyze – I could actually, in your drain, drain it straight off to even an archive, some other type of archive, and having pluggable I.O. modules I could see people finding useful. Right. Those are things we're looking at. And we're also looking at um, trying to handle all different kinds of files. Um, you know, For example, visualization files that the application might write and wants to go to the parallel file system at some point, but doesn't want to input or incur the overhead of writing them. Yeah, we're, we're trying to extend the API to do sort of exactly what you're, you're talking about, Brock, which is um, sort of be able to tag some output um, as having different properties and then treat it differently to, based on those properties. Uh, and so, like Catherine was saying, one of the things we want to do is handle any kind of large output set because any of those are going to be expensive writing to the parallel file system. And so what we'd like to be able to do is cache that in fast storage, uh, apply a redundancy scheme so that if a node fails, we can recover the data and then use the asynchronous transfer um, properties that we have in SCR to actually move that data from the cache down to the, the permanent storage where it's meant to go. Has anyone ever thought about doing the inverse of this? Like, say I have you know some data-intensive input, like a genomic set or something like that, and I actually kind of want to stage different things to the local storage of each node in the background as the rest of the uh, simulation kind of runs. Right. There are people looking at that uh, aspect as, as well. Um, the, that's a different research group here at the lab, but it is an important problem because that, that can be a huge overhead. It's also um, uh, difficult when large-scale applications start up and they use shared libraries. So then they're pulling in a lot of files as well. And um, if you could stage those on the compute nodes or burst buffer or whatever, you could save a lot of time. So what kind of uh, – you've, you've talked about a bunch of forward-looking, we're doing this kind of research, we're doing that kind of research. What other kinds of things have we not covered that you guys are working on? What's coming up in the future for SCR? Hmm. Have we hit everything? I think we might have hit everything. <laughs> Let's look at it. But I forget how many things I have working for me. <laughs> Trying to squirrel-proof it. Yeah. <laughs> that would be a very innovative feature, I think, worth a lot of papers. <laughs> One other feature we're looking at – 
implementing is is something called Cruise. This is a, a user level file system that um, we've worked with uh, from a student from Ohio State. Um, it intercepts all of the POSIX I/O calls uh, so that we can we can handle the data rather than tr- running it through a file system. Um, and so, for example, we're able to use this on systems that don't have RAM disk, uh, which is a Linux way of implementing a file system in memory. Uh, for systems that don't have that, we can implement our own by just allocating a, a region of memory. And then on the right call, we copy data from the user's buffer into this buffer of uh, memory that we've allocated. Um, the other thing that it'll let us do is compress data on the fly. Uh, so during the write call, we can compress data and then write it in order to try to save space. Um, and we can also spill over to other storage devices. So for a node that has a limited amount of memory, uh, we can we can write as much as we can to the memory and then say spill over to a local disk like an SSD or even the parallel file system. Uh, so that piece of software will allow us to run on more systems and and support more applications. And it's been released and can be downloaded and uh, used currently. Right. Yeah. It's really its own stand standalone piece of software. So we expect other people to make use of Cruise um, outside of SCR, although it was implemented with SCR in mind. So, what's some of the strangest uses you've seen of SCR? I don't, I don't know if we've seen anybody using it strangely, but um, the, there were a couple of interesting counterintuitive things we've run into while people were using it. Um, I mean, one of one of the sort of funny stories was while we were implementing it, you know, we're focused on making sure that your job just restarts and always runs in the case of failure. Um, well, we forgot about the case where you actually want to kill the job because you want it to finish. Um, and so we couldn't, we couldn't stop the job. We would, we would run a, a test um, and it would run to its completion and then our scripts would just automatically restart it. And it didn't matter how many times you would try to cancel it, say with control C or something, it just kept going. It was sort of like a zombie process, like night of the walking dead or something. You just couldn't <laughs> kill the job. So we had, we had to go back and modify that. Uh, so you could actually kill the job on purpose. Um, those kind of things we didn't think about. There, there's another case where, um, it's sort of counterintuitive, uh, we started buying SSDs for some of our clusters. Well, it turns out that SSDs increase the failure rate of the nodes because it's one more component that you're adding to your node that has its own failure properties. Um, and so the failure rate of the machine actually increased once you added the SSDs, which you would think would be a bad thing um, from fault tolerance. But because of the increased speed that you can checkpoint at, rather than writing to the parallel file system, you could use the SSDs. Um, you could still make better use of the machine, even though the failure rate of the machine had increased, which was a bit counterintuitive. Um, there was another example of that where we found that, um, let's say you don't have SSDs, you're only using memory. Uh, well, some applications use so much memory that they can't fit uh, a checkpoint in memory along with the working set for the application. Um, but what they might be able to do is spread the job out and use more nodes. Um, so they spread their working set out among more nodes and then free up enough memory so they can save a checkpoint. Uh, but by using more nodes, you're increasing the failure rate of the job because there's more nodes that are likely to fail. And you might also even slow down the job. Some jobs don't scale very well as you increase too big. Uh, so they might actually run more slowly um, if you use more nodes. But even in those cases, we found that you can increase uh, the efficiency of the machine so it can it can be running in more nodes, be running more slowly, and fail more often, but you still get your answer done quicker um, by using something like SCR. That's pretty sweet. Um, so here's a question I like to ask all software developers, uh, just because I like to hear what the different answers are and the different reasons why they answer the way they answer. Uh, what version control system do you guys use for developing SCR and, and why? Yeah, we figured that was your question, Jeff, when I <laughs> that on the list. Well, we're yeah. using Git, um, I think just because we like it. Uh, we had been using SVN and uh, transferred to Git, I'd say, what, early this year? Yeah, I mean, the real reason we switched over to Git was because we, um, especially being at the lab, um, we maintain multiple repos or multiple repositories of the source code. Uh, so we have one internally that we use for development, and then we have one on the outside world on SourceForge um, right now that we like to push to so that uh, people can get a copy of it there. 
Um, and we've also put one in GitHub. Uh, and so we really like Git because that allows us to easily manage the multiple repos in different locations. It's something that we couldn't easily do with SVN. Okay, so uh, I think that's everything we had. Um, so guys, thank you very much for your time. And where can people find SCR? Shoot, I don't remember our URL. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Brock, I dare you to leave that in. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, I have to log in. Hang on. So our main web page is at uh, computation-rnd.lnl.gov forward slash SCR. And from there, you can find a description of SCR um, and all the research directions we have going on and all the software that you, is available for download. And also links to um, our mailing lists and all kinds of good information. Okay, guys, thank you very much for your time. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, guys. This was great. Thank you.